The audio drama, Heartlands, written by Adam Christopher, narrated by Chris Metzen. It's very good. Go check it out. However, there's a joke to be made, and I must make it. And I know this is the precise reason why no one at Blizzard wants to be my friend. I did get a bit of a one-take-done vibe from it. I appreciate that Chris Metzen's a very busy man, but there were a couple of times where I feel like he went into full voice before realising halfway through the line that it wasn't thrall talking. And so I laughed hysterically several times, because in my head it played out like this. Bane and I will aid them. But anyway, let's start the Legion stuff. Bloody 32 years after the Dark Portal, and back in our universe, because the devs wanted to move on from Warlords of Draenor very quickly, the Burning Legion had already been a major threat to Azeroth many, many times. One of those times, centuries ago, a guardian of Tirisfall named Aegwyn had battled an avatar of Sargeras, and only narrowly emerged victorious. Even with her mighty powers, she could not destroy the avatar's body, so, in order to ensure that it would never rise again, she sealed it away in a sunken temple of a loon, slap bang in the middle of the ocean where nobody could fiddle with it. She also sealed away a bunch of powerful artifacts that the avatar had used in combat against her, the jeweled scepter of Sargeras and the Eye of Sargeras. The Sunken Temple then became known as the Tomb of Sargeras, and for centuries after, anyone who tried to access it failed miserably. During the Second War, our original Gul'dan made his way to the tomb, raising it and the island upon which it was built, Thaldranath, out of the ocean, planning to seize the powers of the Eye of Sargeras for himself. However, as he cast open the doors to the temple and entered, he was torn to shreds by demons immediately. The infamous demon hunter Illidan also broke into the tomb at one point, seeking the eye, this time during the Third War. And unlike Mr. Torn to Shreds the moment he stepped inside, Illidan was successful. But he was later defeated at the Black Temple, with Maiev Shadowsong and her Watchers taking his body, along with his Illidari, for eternal imprisonment. Everybody then, understandably, left the tomb alone for a while, until the bronze dragon Kairos Dormu and Garrosh Hellscream's plans changed everything, and history began to repeat itself. After being force-pushed through the Black Gate on Draenor, alternate Gul'dan arrived on Azeroth, and was immediately contacted by Kil'jaeden, the other former leader of the Eridar. Now Kil'jaeden had been involved when original Gul'dan attempted to betray the Legion, and got his ass ripped to shreds, and he knew that this alternate Gul'dan would do exactly the same damn thing if he was sent to the tomb. However, Kil'jaeden still saw an opportunity, so he filled the Warlock's mind with his voice in order to keep him on a tight leash, and sent him across the ocean to infiltrate the tomb, where a portal to the Twisting Nether could be empowered, thereby providing the Legion with a new gateway to Azeroth. By the time Gul'dan actually arrived at the Broken Isles, Archmage Khadgar was hot on his heels, having used his considerable skill to track down the Warlock. Khadgar had backup from Maiev Shadowsong, who still led the Watchers. She was more than willing to help because she feared that her vault, also located on the Broken Isles, was the Legion's true target. So, she head there to secure said vault, whilst Khadgar pursued Gul'dan into the tomb. Deep within the complex, Khadgar engaged the Warlock in battle, but Kil'jaeden commanded Gul'dan to hold back. He had plans for the Archmage. So, Gul'dan went ahead and shrouded himself with fell magic conveniently blinding Khadgar for a moment, and then buggered off to break Aegwyn's ancient seals within the tomb. The Archmage recovered, tracking Gul'dan down yet again as he approached the final seal, unleashing more magical attacks, and Gul'dan pleaded to Kil'jaeden to grant him a portion of the tomb's powers. The Warlock could not possibly break the barrier and defeat Khadgar at the same time. Now the Demon Lord still did not trust Gul'dan, but success was very close at hand, so he went ahead and granted Gul'dan's request. With that new borrowed power, Gul'dan broke the final seal, and as the tomb began to start charging the portal below, the Warlock went ahead and took that power for himself instead. Surprise, surprise. He then immediately sent Khadgar flying out of the chamber, collapsing the only path inside, feeling really pleased with himself because he now held the power to challenge all of Azeroth. But, upon the realisation that that fight would probably be never-ending, he changed his mind. A mood which I can actually totally relate to nowadays. Bringing the Legion to Azeroth was Gul'dan's best chance at capturing the victory that had thus far eluded him, so he relinquished his new power 
to activate the portal to the Twisting Nether, a choice which Kiljaden commended him for. Well done, you are not as much of a dumbass as your original counterpart. The portal opened, and demons started to erupt from it, so Khadgar went ahead and cheesed it, changing into a raven, and leaving the broken shore as it very quickly became overrun. It was time to inform the world leaders. The Burning Legion had returned. It wasn't hard to convince the King of Stormwind that immediate action was needed, and Warchief Fulgin also sprang to action as well. A joint war council was then called, with everyone agreeing to lead the forces of the Horde and Alliance against the Legion, and even the groups that rarely get involved with combat stuff agreed to help, like the Earthen Ring, even though shamans actually canonically despise war and value the preservation of harmony above all else. And the Paladins of the Argent Crusade, who had sworn the day of their creation that they would only fight against creatures of pure evil, which had mostly just consisted of fighting remnants of the Scourge in the Plaguelands. But Tyrion Fordring acknowledged that this threat was also creatures of pure evil, so he pledged his order's support as well. And with that, the combined forces set out, sailing for the Broken Isles, led by flying gunships, which carried Varian Rin on one and Sylvanas Windrunner on the other. As they neared the Broken Shore, everything went to poop instantly. The land, sky and sea was absolutely teeming with demons. However, despite the two gunships crashing into each other at one point, they still made it. Azeroth's defenders landed on the beach and pressed forward, with Jaina Proudmoore, Gen Greymane, Varian Rin and Gelbin Mechatork leading the Alliance offensive, and Warchief Vol'jin, Thrall, Sylvanas and Bane leading the Horde. Bane and I will aid them. Although the two forces did manage to thin the demons' numbers quite a bit, things then started to go very wrong. Firstly, Tyrion Fordring was captured by Gul'dan. The heroes fought desperately to try and save the bloke, but he died, very unceremoniously, at the hands of Doom Lord Croesus. The writers intended for this to act as a massive blow to the morale of the story characters, but I think they may have slightly underestimated how pissed off the players would be. After that, players became even more pissed off both factions split up, with the Horde taking a ridge, covering the Alliance's flank. However, it soon became very apparent that the odds were stacked against us. Despite all of the hours of fighting and all of the demons slain, the Legion's reinforcements were just going to keep coming, and according to Chronicle, the Horde fought to the last moment, giving King Varian an opening to pursue Gul'dan into the valley below. But with demons converging on the ridge, Thrall knocked down and Vol'jin gravely injured, Sylvanas just had no bloody choice. Her hands were tied. She called for retreat, and she felt really bad about it, apparently. Meanwhile, below, Gen Greymane was furious at the Horde's retreat. Varian commanded Gen to redirect the Alliance's remaining forces back to the gunship for evacuation. But as said gunship took to the skies, a fell reaver grabbed hold of it and wouldn't let bloody go. Varian then handed Gen a letter he had written to his son, Prince Anduin, should the worst ever befall him. And then he leapt from the ship, attacking the Fell Reaver so that his troops could escape. The King then fell to the broken shore below, fighting to the very end to get to Gul'dan, but he was overwhelmed by demonic forces, and Gul'dan then personally executed him, reducing the heroic King to nothing but ash. So all in all, that battle was a big old pile of wank and couldn't have possibly gone any worse. Both Horde and Alliance had lost many of their greatest fighters, weapons, and even their leaders. And with the Horde and Alliance off licking their wounds, Gul'dan moved forward with his nefarious plan. In order to bring Sargeras to Azeroth, they were going to need a body strong enough to withstand the powerful Titan. A body capable of becoming the new avatar of Sargeras. And apparently, Illidan, the Legion's old hated enemy, was the best possible host. Unfortunately, he was gone. Dispatched by the champions of Azeroth several expansions ago and his body, as well as his Illidari, had seemingly vanished. However, luckily for Gul'dan, Cordana Felsong was now pledged to the Legion after the events of Warlords of Draenor, and since she had once been a Warden, she knew exactly where the legendary Demon Hunter's body was. In Azuna, not far from the Broken Shore, Illidan and his Illidari were being kept in stasis within the Vault of the Wardens. Not only did Cordana know the location, but she also knew exactly how to access it, and combat my Evan her peeps as well. So off they went, backed by an army of demons. As soon as those demons breached the walls, my Evan her wardens knew they were up against it. Things were not looking good. So she did something that went against every fibre of her being. 
she freed the Illidari to bolster their defences. Both the Demon Hunters and Wardens then tentatively joined forces, racing to reach Gul'dan and Cordana, but they were too late. The Warlock and Dominated Warden had obtained Illidan's body and vanished through a portal. A little bit more fighting then ensued because the vault was still very much filled with demons, but the Illidari eventually managed to find an exit and emerged to find Khadgar, who was just kind of hanging about outside. The Demon Hunters then agreed to join either Alliance or Horde, depending on which race of elf they happened to be, and that is the end of the Demon Hunters starting zone. Technically, the first half of their starting zone takes place way back during the Black Temple raid, so go watch the Illidan Supercut or something. Does that make me sound like a real YouTuber? I hope so. Anywho, despite still recovering from the battle for Broken Shore, both the Horde and Alliance needed to get their acts together and select some new leaders, pronto. In Orgrimmar, Warchief Vol'jin was still technically alive, but barely. He was not going to make it, and as he sat, slumped, dying on his throne, he received a vision from the Lower. They told him that he should appoint Sylvanas Windrunner as his successor, which confused him a little bit, but he wasn't going to question their wisdom. So, in his dying breath, he told Sylvanas to step out of the shadows and lead. Words which shook the Banshee Queen somewhat. This was now the second of the Jailer's prophecies that had come to pass, so she quietly sent word to the Jailer to officially pledge herself to his cause after that, at some point, off screen. However, during Vol'jin's funeral, the Legion went ahead and attacked again. Agents of the Burning Legion had infiltrated the event, and they would have got away with it too if it weren't for the pesky Blood Elf Illidari who had come to Orgrimmar in order to join the Horde. They saved Sylvanas' life in the process, so she officially welcomed them to the faction, but she did warn them that betrayal akin to the one that Illidan had committed would land them a fate worse than death. After that, she appointed Orc Varric Sarfang as her second in command. He was an Orc favourite, as well as an intelligent warrior and a capable weapons expert, so that was a good choice. Meanwhile, with the Alliance, a funeral was held for King Varian Rin. Though his coffin at Lion's Rest was empty, for obvious reasons, there wasn't really a body to bury. Prince Anduin Rin, who had aged dramatically in the last two years, was now set to succeed his father, but he was having a bit of a hard time with that. The prospect of leadership was daunting. Whereas Varian had distinguished himself as a gifted warrior, Anduin had not. Martial prowess wasn't exactly his forte. He had studied under Prophet Velen and devoted himself to the light. Violence was a last resort, as far as he was concerned. And yet, here he now was, a king, expected to lead his people into a battle against a very powerful enemy who threatened to wipe out all life in existence. But he wasn't alone. The power of friendship. He had the full might of the Alliance at his back. Prophet Velen and Gen Greymane knew Anduin well enough to have guessed that he would have these internal struggles, so they made it clear to the young king that they were going to help. All of the Alliance leaders would assist in any way they could. The Kirin Tor were also reconsidering their leadership under Jaina Proudmoor. The Horde had done quite a bit to try and make amends for past transgressions, and yet Jaina still held a grudge. Their retreat at the Broken Shore was proof, in her opinion, that the Horde were a bunch of jerks. As such, she was blocking any attempt to allow Horde-aligned mages to rejoin the Kirin Tor, which was effectively neutering them. The Mage Order needed all the power it could possibly get to fight the Legion. So, the Council of Six held a vote hearing arguments from both Jaina and Khadgar, and ultimately they voted against Jaina in a tense 4-2 result. Jaina had a strop and rage quit the game, whilst leadership of the Kirin Tor was handed to Khadgar, his first act being an invitation to the Horde Mages to come on back. Shortly after that, a new revelation came to light, with Khadgar receiving word that the Dwarven King Magni Bronzebeard had re-emerged after years of being frozen in diamond. He had a whole bunch of new insights into the nature of Azeroth itself, insights that the Kirin Tor needed to hear. So, Khadgar immediately departed to Alduar to have a chat with him. Magni then revealed that he could hear the voice of Azeroth itself. The World Soul had warned him of Sargeras and the Legion, and told him that there was only one way to defeat them. When the Titans had first visited the planet, they'd created powerful artifacts to help them order the place. The Pillars of Creation. These would be needed to close Gul'dan's portal to the Twisting Nether and cut off the Legion's endless reinforcements. One slight problem though, the Pillars of Creation had been lost during the War of the Ancients, on the Broken Isles. They were going to need to head directly into the heart of Legion territory. 
But despite the risk, the leaders of the Kirin Tor rounded up as many Horde and Alliance champions as they possibly could at Dalaran, and then wove a spell that transported the entire city to the Broken Isles. And with that, the Legion expansion was now under Fuey. The Order Halls bit kind of squeezes in here, sort of. Although the Alliance and Horde now had a plan to close off the Legion's access to Azeroth, and a base of operations within enemy territory, that didn't undo the fact that they'd lost miserably at the Battle for Broken Shore. They were still pretty ill-equipped to face the Legion, and to make matters worse, the Legion had now spread across Azeroth, from the Barrens to the Maelstrom to Karazhan and some other places. So both factions established Order Halls, dedicated to every single class, designed to develop a new generation, as well as hone the skills of existing players as well. And thanks to a bunch of knowledge sharing, information on ancient powerful weapons came to light. Now I'm a little bit surprised that this particular section didn't focus on a different artifact weapon, but here's an example of one of them. After becoming quite disheartened since the Makgora with Garrosh, Thrall felt like the Doomhammer was dead weight in his hands. The elements no longer heeded his call, and seeing Vol'jin fall in battle at the Broken Shore had only helped to put Thrall even further down in the dumps. The final nail in the coffin was the moment the Legion attacked the Heart of Azeroth at the Maelstrom, the Shamanic Order Hall, with Thrall losing the Doomhammer during that fight. Fortunately, a champion head out to retrieve that legendary weapon, and came back with it very quickly. However, they were ever so slightly surprised and excited when Thrall decided that they should keep it, urging them to lead the Earthen Ring. The former Warchief and his life mate Agra then packed up their children and buggered off. Destination? Nagrand, where they wished to live happily ever after. Thrall did pay one final visit to Saurfang though, asking the new Warchief second in command to keep watch over their people and not let them be swayed from their path ever again. Saurfang had sacrificed much for the Horde, including his own son, so Thrall trusted him, even if he didn't fully trust Sylvanas. And yes, Thrall had trusted Garrosh in the past, so maybe he wasn't the best judge of character, but shut up. He's learned from that or something. And we'll end this video on the bit about the Nightwell. Whilst the people of Azeroth were getting settled on Dalaran and doing artifact weapon quests, Gul'dan was marching his forces north, across the Broken Isles, with swarms of his demons prodding at the magical protections around Soromo. Now Soromo was the home to the secretive Nightborn Elves, most of which had not set foot outside the city for over 10,000 years. Their city's defences were strong, but likely not strong enough to last forever against a relentless demonic onslaught, so while some Nightborn were willing to fight, others were considering an immediate surrender, out of sheer self-preservation. Gul'dan then sent an ultimatum to the leader of Soromar, one Grand Magistrix Selassander, saying surrender or die, basically. Hoping they'd pick surrender, because their ancient arcane powers would be a welcome addition to the Legion's strength, but also he wanted access to the Nightwell, a font of unrivaled power fed by Azeroth's ley lines. What Gul'dan didn't know though, was that a pillar of creation resided at the centre of the Nightwell. The Eye of Amanthul. Now, Elisander's chief advisor, First Arcanist Thalithera, urged the Grand Magistrix not to accept Gul'dan's crap offer. The Legion can't be trusted. We'll be safe, so long as the barrier holds. She pointed out that if the Legion truly held the might to bring down the barrier, why would they need to negotiate? It was nothing but a bluff. However, after listening to her advisor's counsel, Elisander went ahead and just sided with Gul'dan anyway. But in her defence, she had no idea about the Horde and Alliance, the heroes that were rising up to stand against this overwhelming enemy. She only knew that if the Nightborn had to fight against the Legion, they would definitely lose. The Lyssera then attempted to stage a coup, but that failed, with the Grand Magistrix's elite guards dealing easily with the unrest, whilst the First Arcanist herself was betrayed by advisor Melendrus. He stabbed her, and dumped her body off the walls of the city into the harbour. However, she actually survived that, and crawled away from the city as the barrier around it fell. In that moment, Thalithera swore that she would return to Sorama and take her city back. Somehow. Someday. Or something. <laughs>